Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Gula. Today, with my co-founder, Martin Yeager, we will be presenting an overview of the Open DC Grid Project, which is an effort to create an open standard for a DC microgrid focused on the energy access markets. Today's presentation will start with an overview of the energy access markets, and then I'll give an overview of the ODG project itself, go on to talk about some of the technical problems we're wrestling with, and then we'll finish up with, uh, hand it off to, to Martin, who will talk about the use of the Zephyr operating system in power applications. Various sources suggest that up to 10% of the world don't have access to electricity, but that's an oversimplification. In reality, most of the world has some access to electricity, but not reliable electricity, and not as much as they want and need. The World Bank has broken this unserved demand into various tiers based on what people currently have. People want more and, and thus would like to move up in the tiers, but are limited by what they can afford. We see the ODG project as focused on the middle tiers, something above the minimum, but less than the full access that the developed world has, which would typically be an AC microgrid. Here are some examples of devices that serve these various tiers, ranging from a solar lantern that's just a light with a solar panel to charge it up through various forms of standalone solar home systems and ranging up to small mini grids. As another form of distribution, many people get access to electricity through shared kiosk systems that charge a specific device like a mobile phone or a portable battery that they can take home and use for their applications. People in the developed world often have similar needs for emergencies in emergencies and in recreational activities. Here are some examples of the kinds of devices that people in the energy access markets would like to use. Lighting is universal and makes a huge difference in people's lives, but not far behind are the desires for entertainment in the form of television and communication in the form of mobile phones. Even though as much as 40% of the world doesn't have access to, to clean cooking, people don't recognize the possibility of cooking with electricity. It's a key challenge because it requires far more, far more electricity than the other kinds of applications. In addition to home appliances, people need to use electricity to make money. These applications are referred to as productive use applications. The needs in this area are diverse and can include, include devices that we don't usually think of as money-making devices, such as refrigerators and televisions. Another challenge for the energy access markets is the problem of distribution. At the end of the distribution chain are the end users, the people. These people typically have very little income, sometimes less than $2 a day. Their income can vary widely from month to month and from year to year. They have very little capital to make purchases and have little or no credit that they can use. The people in this situation are often transient and hence reluctant to pay for non-portable technology like household wiring. Companies selling into this market have various strategies. In many places, particularly in Africa, energy access products are sold via direct sales. A company will set up in a village and sell products door to door. Companies in this space typically operate in narrow geographic regions and are relatively small compared to the uh, familiar technology giants that we're aware of. These companies are, are often vertically integrated and do their own engineering. Um, they do their own product assembly and distribution. To deal with the financial challenges of their customers, they resort to creative financing methods. One particular popular scheme is, is so-called pay-as-you-go financing, in which if a customer cannot pay their service or even their appliances are di temporarily disabled until the customer has funds to resume service. Different solutions to the distribution challenge are used in different parts of the world. The African market is dominated by small entrepreneurs. In South Asia, various government schemes have been used to distribute product. In East Asia, people often assemble their own solar home systems by buying components from a local market. And as wait a minute, one might expect, 
these home-built systems often have compatibility and other technical problems. Now, let me shift gears and talk about the ODG project itself. ODG is an attempt to create a technical standard. Historically, such standards have been built by organizations such as the IEEE, the ISO, and the IEC, and others. It's our view that the standards process used by these organizations is not a good fit for the energy market and that a new process is needed, one based on the principles of open source. At OGG, we believe that technical knowledge captured in standards should be accessible to everyone and not locked behind expensive paywalls. ODG is not funded by any big organization and we have no hidden agenda. We're just private individuals trying to make a difference. We think that the open source model is particularly appropriate for the energy access market because that market is highly fragmented with a lot of small companies with limited resources. We'd like to encourage entrepreneurship on a shoestring. At ODG, our approach involves the parallel definition of the standard with demonstration hardware and software, so we can standardize what works rather than our personal biases. Our standard is not complete until we can demonstrate working hardware and software. Our prototype hardware and software can be freely used in, inter in commercial products, and we consider it's, it's just fine or okay to make, uh, make money off our work. At ODG, our key objective is improving lives with electricity. Specifically, that means we want to reduce the cost of off-grid or weak-grid electricity. We want to improve the flexibility and expandability of solar home systems, which are often a closed garden of proprietary technology. We want to simplify the implementation of and use of off-grid electricity. I'd like to point out, however, that we don't expect conforming devices to be available in a local market anytime soon. We expect the direct sales model to continue in many places. We see our role as creating compatible devices that companies can OEM from low cost sources. They may still choose to distribute locked systems, but they will have the option to unlock their systems and have them work with products from other vendors if that suits their business model. So what are we not trying to do? We're not trying to replace the AC grid with DC grid. That's a hard problem. It's not clear it's all that beneficial anyway. We're not trying to create a universal DC plug that would replace all existing DC plugs. That's another tar pit. We're not trying to create complete sellable home solar home systems. We expect companies to add value and differentiation in their products. And finally, we're focused on relatively small grids such as those below 10 kilowatts. Let me shift now and talk about the technical challenges we're facing with ODG. Our primary goal has been to create interoperable devices, devices that can plug into each other without a lot of configuration and be reasonably assured of working. Compatibility involves three areas, electrical, functional, and communications. Electrical compatibility involves basic issues like voltage ranges, currents, and grounding. But it also involves more subtle issues like stability criteria when dealing with constant power loads, which produce it, present a negative impedance to the grid. Safety is also a consideration, particularly when people are unused to electricity, as we need to minimize the chances of electrocution and fires. DC also has some unique challenges compared to AC, as DC sustains arcs at voltages and currents where AC does not. On the functional side, we have issues common to any microgrid, such as demand response, and issues, and, and an issue that is even more critical than with a typical AC microgrid, because the cost sensitivity in energy access markets means that microgrids are more likely to be operating at their power limits. To expand a basic home or solar home system, the ability to supply a microgrid with multiple power sources is a key functionality. We are implementing a dynamically adjustable droop curve to, adjust, to allocate power between sources. We have the normal typical operations of a microgrid, including mon monitoring and management requirements. And we also want to include a low level protocol to support the PAGO mechanism that I referred to previously in all devices, giving the system vendor the option to enable or disable that mechanism. The, functional, the functional capabilities need communications. In this area, we're primarily using existing tech networking technology, but we do have some unique requirements for very low cost physical solutions. ODG aspires to create a standard. 
this means that we need to deliver a formal version control document that defines the standards, like similar documents from the IEEE or the IEC. And like those organizations, our standard will be accessible online and free to use under a Creative Commons license. In keeping with our goal to create a practical standard validated with working implementations, we are also going to supply open source hardware schematics for working hardware that can be used for testing or even the basis for manufactured products. We expect OEMs to take our designs, cost reduce them, add unique features, and offer them to system integrators in the energy access markets. In addition to the hardware schematics, our repositories also include open source firmware and prototype software for remote management. In our view, a standard is not worth much unless the products can be validated to conform. So another key part of our deliverables is a test suite that OEMs can use to validate that their products conform. I'm only gonna to touch on the system architecture that we're considering because this is a big topic, too big to address in the short presentation, and also because it's a work in progress. Basically, we imagine an ODG microgrid to be a network of devices connected via links to ports on the physical devices. Ports can source power, sync power, or both. We want the architecture and the associated software protocols to be independent of the physical connectivity and communications in use. We anticipate smart loads that can implement demand response using communications and dumb loads that are configured as a static load for a particular microgrid. All sources must, be, must implement communications, but a non-communicating source can be used with a bridge, bridge adapter that is just electronics and, and doesn't require a battery. That said, we are defining a small set of physical links that can be used for various applications. We're currently focused on 12 volt links and 48 volt links. The 12 volt bus is electrically similar and compatible with the 12 volt auxiliary power outlet or sometimes known as the cigarette lighter outlet, available in most cars. That way we can enable existing 12 volt appliances to be used as dumb loads on an, on an ODG 12 volt bus microgrid. Like the IEEE 2030.10 that I've been involved with for some time, we're defining a, our 48 volt link to be electrically compatible with the ISO 21780 standard for 48 volt electricity in mild hybrid cars. That way we can use the 48 volt subsystems um, in, in can use them on a 48 or on our 48 volt uh, ODG microgrid. We also want to incorporate existing DC technology into the architecture whenever practical. In particular, we want to we anticipate incorporating USB-C with relatively simple bridges as additional ports on a solar home system compatible with ODG. We anticipate using USB vendor extensions to carry the ODG functionality, such as demand response that goes beyond the normal USB interactions, but in a compatible way so that non-conforming USB devices can be used in an ODG grid with reduced functionality. Let me provide a few details about our current 12 volt thinking. This evolved from some uh, conversations with GAGLA, the Global Off-Grid -Grid Lighting Association. They're trying to standardize on a 12 volt connector that all vendors can use. Most existing systems use some kind of barrel connector, but they come in many different sizes and even different polarity. These vendors are very cost sensitive and spending a few cents more on a connector makes a difference to them. One might ask, why not just use USB for this task? Because of all the economies of scale, USB connectors are very cheap, as cheap as barrel connectors in many cases, but what's not cheap is the interface electronics. Even though the volumes are high, the USB power requirements for anything more than a five volt, two amp connections are complex and expensive to implement. We want a standard that could deliver up to 100 watts where the implementation costs are much lower than USB. We have a few more, or quite a few more details about our 12 volt proposal and backup slides. This next slide talks about our current thinking on the 48 volt bus. Because of the IR drops at 12 volts, we anticipate that solar home systems that need to connect over any distance will use the 48 volt rather than the 12 volt bus. For example, one would connect several homes that wanna share power using the 48 volt bus. Or one could create a small village mini grid using the 48, distribu 48 volt distribution carried on power poles to multiple houses sharing a common PV system. We're also looking at 48 volts as a higher power way to link multiple power sources in a home. 
we're basically viewing this as a managed version of IEEE 2030.10, doing some of the more important tasks that 2030.10 ducks, such as demand response and multiple power sources for, via droop curves. Martin's done a lot of work on using the CAN bus for communicating devices. This is relatively inexpensive and works for well for short distances. For longer distances, we need some alternative form of communication, such as power line networking or one of the <clears throat> flavors of wireless networking. With that, I'm going to hand off the presentation to my colleague, Martin Yeager. I just hand wave about block diagrams and dabble with software, but Martin actually builds things. Thanks. Thanks, Jim, and hello also from my side. My name is Martin Jäger, and I'm the founder of LibreSolar, which uh, develops and builds open source hardware components for renewable energy systems. In uh, this talk, I will give you a short introduction about the technologies we are using to develop the hardware and uh, yeah, how we are trying to implement the standards we are developing within the open DC grid project. As Jim pointed out already, uh, the hardware is uh, designed in a way that it is very modular and easily extendable so that it allows uh, to collaborate with other companies who can build uh, based on the existing Libre Solo hardware. So here on the left side, uh, you can see a project that we've done together with Connected Energy, where we took one of the Libre Solo MPPT charge controllers and added GSM communication modules to it so that it can implement the pay-as-you-go um, yeah, payment model in solar home systems. On the right side, you can see our recent project that we're doing with the UK-based scene. And uh, we are building a 48-volt DC grid that interconnects different households. Uh, also with uh, a DC-DC converter that's based on the Libre Solar hardware and extended with some additional control features. So here's uh, how the Libre Solar charge controller looks like uh, in a bit more detail. Uh, of course, at the bottom we've got some uh, power terminals where you can connect the solar panel and the battery and the load. Currently for this version, uh, it supports uh, 12 or 24 volt battery systems and up to 20 amps uh, charging or discharging current through the load output. Then we've also got some uh, different connectors for communications. Uh, in this case, it's a CAN bus based communication, but it could also be more simple and cheap serial interfaces. All the uh, PCBs we uh, build are developed in KiCad, so also the tools are completely open source and uh, yeah, allow for easier uh, tuning and collaboration. Uh, within the um, microcontroller, we are running Zephyr Artos. Um, I will focus on that in the next slides. And the microcontroller we are using is an STM32 in this case. And one important distinct features, which also yeah, is very beneficial for the open source approach is this um, universal extension connector at the top, which provides the most uh, important communication interfaces like X squared C, um, a serial interface and SPI, so that you can plug in custom modules and extend the hardware with different other radio uh, communication interfaces, for example. We are using Zephyr Artos for our firmware development because it's really easy to customize it depending on your board hardware. It has already many drivers built in and uh, also uses the device tree and k-config from the Linux kernel. Uh, also, it has a strong focus on safety and security. Uh, Kate Stewart will have a dedicated talk on this topic. Of course, it supports lots of IoT protocols, but also uh, older industrial protocols like Modbus, so it's easy to communicate to inverters, for example. And last but not least, it has a really great community and an open governance, so if you've got any problems, just raise an issue and uh, you will get help in a very short period of time. In the charge controller, we've got multiple tasks running in parallel. The most important and time critical one is the digital control of the DC-DC converter, which runs synchronous to the PWM signal generation at 70 kHz. 
Then we've got some um, yeah, more higher level control functions that run at uh, 10 hertz frequency and uh, the energy calculation and data aggreg aggregation running at 1 hertz. Uh, in parallel to that, the communication interfaces react on incoming requests or send out data in a regular interval, for example, to an MQTT broker via GSM modem. All those uh, functions are already provided by Zephyr. So, for example, there is a LoRaWAN stack that has recently been merged. And also for the CAN bus interface, there are lots of um, higher level application protocols already existing in the firmware. That's it already. Thanks for listening. If you want to keep in contact with us, uh, please visit the opendcgrid.org website. We've got a monthly meeting and we invite everyone to join. Uh, on the website, you can also find the recordings of previous meetings and the current status of the standard documents. Yeah, and on the um, LibreSolar website and the, the GitHub organization, you can get access to the hardware and firmware repositories and you'll also find a community forum and uh, open educational resources. Yeah, hello everyone, and thanks hello. for listening. Hello. So, from my side. Yeah, we're open to questions. Quiet group this morning. People haven't had their coffee yet, I think. Well, here it's uh, afternoon already, so it depends on, on where you're coming from. True. Okay, there's a question from uh, Stefan Eihorn regarding the uh, communication. So if we ever considered uh, using device to device communication at all. Um, yes, uh, we do consider it. So um, I think it depends a bit on the, uh, the type of the system. So if, for example, you've got a slightly larger battery array with maybe productive use and a milling machine and uh, potentially multiple solar panels or a big solar panel, then it would make sense, if, especially if it's a lithium ion battery, to communicate between the battery and the um, charge controller. And this would probably be done with the CAN bus. But if you uh, consider a, a situation with the solar home system, then we'd most probably not have a uh, device to device communication because it's a, an atomic unit more or less. So it would only send out monitoring data to the, uh, yeah, to the cloud and get some information back from the cloud. Yeah. And, and regarding the communication between the, participants in a grid. So if the distance is quite far, like 50 to 100 meters, then uh, most probably the CAN bus will not be used anymore because then you need additional wiring. Uh, we were thinking about uh, power line communications, um, but our main idea is that the, um, the really critical communication for power sharing is done via droop control. So essentially you uh, measure the local voltage of the 48 volt, volt grid. And if the voltage is high, it means that you have uh, lots of renewable energy in the system. And if it's low, then uh, you are in danger of overloading the grid. And based on that, the devices can already react. And only for the slower like energy uh, management type of communication, we would need something uh, that can also be done by a cloud and uh, be done uh, in a much small, uh, slower um, frequency. So I see Bruce has a question about uh, intermittent connection to a utility grid. You know, it's clear at that point that I guess they refer to it as the point of common coupling. We would need to uh, basically interface to the, you know, more common standards that are addressed um, in this conference and the various kinds of infrastructure that is being addressed in this conference. There are also the existing uh, standards, uh, I think it's 2030.5, that 
essentially would would describe the way an inverter connects to the utility grid and, and clearly we need to be compatible with that so there's going to have to be a bridge between what we're doing in the dc space and the ac space yeah there's one other question regarding lora one um yeah so this is still in the quite early phase. Currently, we are mainly using GSM communications, but the idea would be that in the future you can have uh, one GSM gateway that listens to all the data that's uh, communicated with the actual devices with LoRaWAN. Um, we have been sending some um, yeah, energy data, for example, uh, so the the daily energy usage or the hourly usage basically an energy counter and some basic status information but as you know the uh, payload of uh, LoRaWAN is really low and uh, yeah also if if you want to increase the range then the payload gets even less so it's really uh, only very basic type of information and uh, status of the devices Unfortunately, firmware upgrade over the air with LoRaWAN is uh, really an issue. So uh, that's also something for the future. Um, cellular connectivity is a necessity. Uh, I would say it depends. Uh, so the systems, for example, with the droop control mechanisms can work completely independent of any uh, radio connectivity. But as soon as you want to implement uh, business models that rely on pay-as-you-go mechanisms, then, well, you can also have an offline method with tokens, uh, like with uh, prepaid SIM cards. But if you want to have a data connection to the internet, then uh, you rely on GSM communications, yes. There's another question. Maybe, Jim, do you want to answer the, the one regarding... Questions about Paygo. Well, yeah. I think the reality is, you know, people have electrical needs and this is a very challenging market. And so, you know, I think we need to accept that, you know, people, you know, that sell into this market have to make a living. And in some cases that requires, you know, um, closed systems. You know, our, clearly our, our goal would be to create open systems so that anybody could go down to their market and, and get a compatible system. But that's not, not necessarily realistic that, you know, we, we need to sort of deal with the world as it is. And so I think we're willing to accept some compromises to get there. But you know, eventually, hopefully, it'll, be, it'll open up over time. Yeah, so we're, we're also hoping with the open source approach that in the future, uh, the the manufacturing can be decentralized and localized so that maybe things like a larger company that does pay go is not necessary anymore but we are not quite there yet and uh, so maybe that's necessary as an intermediary step uh, but thanks for the link i'll definitely have a look into it later yeah. on thank you any other questions we've got maybe one minute left Uh, experience regarding open source hardware. Yes, uh, there are quite uh, there's quite uh, good feedback sometimes coming, and uh, we know of quite a few people who rebuilt the hardware. Um, we haven't got many pull requests uh, with uh, for the open hardware designs, uh, so people tend to be more actively contributing to the firmware of the devices. But still, we get comments and uh, issues, and so it still makes sense to to have everything open and uh, makes fun. <laughs> you know, there was a question about you know, can you have a truly local market with no cloud? You know, I think most of the companies that are participating in this market are very interested in what their customers are doing. So, like any other business, you know, they're they're eager to understand what their customers need and what they're actually doing. So I think practically most cases, um, the companies that uh, OEM or, or distribute these products do have a cloud infrastructure, but certainly the technology is, is perfectly capable of running with, with no cloud. It, it, it's entirely autonomous. 
So I think we've uh, got to leave now. Thanks everyone for uh, listening and uh, yeah, you can get in contact uh, via these uh, chat functions and so on. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hello everyone. We're we're here to answer any questions that people might have. Hello everyone. Thanks for listening. Quiet group. Hmm. Yeah, not so many people in the in the room anymore than in the previous session. DC. So there, there are a couple of reasons for DC. Um, basically, DC is simpler. You know, with, with AC, you have to do all the synchronization and you have the um, reactive power kinds of problems that all those go away with DC. Um, when you're trying to do uh, really inexpensive low end stuff, um, you know, DC is just a lot easier to work with. And also for the communities that we're trying to serve, um, you know, the AC power is potentially dangerous. These are many of these people have not really experienced uh, electricity before. So the, the 48 volt or the 12 volt that we're offering is, is much safer for that community. Uh, Katara, let's see. First target application is, uh, yes, definitely. We're primarily focused on the off grid environment. Um, we, we certainly anticipate that in many of these communities, um, you know, the world is, is rapidly electrifying and, and electricity is available in more and more places. But in many cases, it's, it's so-called weak electricity, meaning it's intermittent electricity. And in many places, there are the so-called under the wire people, that people that have electricity nearby but can't afford it. You know, it's been found that a, a DC connection is significantly less expensive than making an, a connection to an AC grid. Um, you know, potentially roughly a third of the of the cost, uh, just for a whole variety of reasons. Yeah, and uh, for for the project I already mentioned, uh, that's uh, gonna be um, yeah done in in Rwanda soon. Uh, we are connecting people uh, partly who previously didn't have any access to electricity or who did already have a solar home system, but uh, the when the demand grows then it's not so easy to extend the solar home system. So uh, with the 48 volt grid that sits somewhere between the AC grid that requires lots of infrastructure investment and uh, all the safety regulations and so on, uh, with our 48 volt grid, we are sitting between those AC grids and the solar home systems and can even interconnect the solar home systems and potentially in, in the future also with the AC grid. And uh, so the first project uh, we are aiming for uh, power per connection of maximum 250 watts if it's a 12 volt battery. And uh, in the future, we are going to expand to slightly larger appliances for productive use in the range of a kilowatt to maybe two kilowatts. But that's about the maximum that's feasible with the grid interface with 48 volts. So there's a question, why do we need an, an open hardware standard? And we should probably distinguish between uh, an open interface standard and then technology based on open access hardware. So the, the standard that we're developing is, is an electrical interface. The, uh, the boards that we're creating are simply uh, examples of uh, boards that conform to that interface, we, we by no means expect people to necessarily use them. They're free to use whatever uh, hardware technology they want. They're free to use ours as a starting point. 
they can use ours as a sort of reference to test against. But as I said, uh, you can you can do anything as long as you conform to the electrical interface. Any more questions? Make one more comment about uh, YDC. Uh, for a lot of the the people that are in the uh, energy access market, they they actually uh, don't have AC appliances. Um, typically, the lighting is very low uh, low, low power, uh, LED, you know, LED kinds of lighting. Even things like television and refrigerators um, are are being offered in DC. And there's some argument that the DC appliances could potentially, you know, if they could reach enough volume, actually be competitive with AC appliances. Uh, how, how much, much demand? De Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> how much demand there is uh, to connect uh, solar home systems in these areas? I want to ask real situations in these areas. So. Um, well, uh, it's still in the early stages of uh, this technology with the uh, 48 volts grid, um, but uh, there are quite a few households which uh, already have a solar home system and uh, want to get bigger loads and basically want to get up in the this energy um, access ladder. Um, I can't really say any uh, don't really have any numbers uh, how, how many there are but uh, definitely demand is usually growing so uh, if people don't have access to electricity at all then it's really a huge step forward to have lighting but then they realize okay um, I might also want to have a TV or um, have a fridge which is uh, often a yeah, very important step to, to keep the, the food um, good and um, yeah so we see that in this spot we could come with the uh, DC grid and uh, help them to to grow the lighting global association publish uh, publishes market surveys of the various kinds of devices and I think their numbers are that there are sort of tens of millions of people buying the very entry level um, sort of lantern kinds of things, um, rel substantially less in the sort of solar home system market in the millions, but not, I don't think, in the tens of millions. And that's one of the challenges that we're trying to address is that, you know, to to keep the cost down, you've got to get the volume higher. And so there's this sort of virtuous cycle if you can reduce the cost, but the, it works the other way as well. Yeah, and one improvement with the 48-volt grid would also be that uh, you can have a more centralized um, PV generation with larger solar panels and don't need to have uh, 150 watts or even less solar panel in each household and uh, potentially even uh, get rid of the batteries in each household and supply users with really low demand with the, purely with the grid without any generation locally. We're, we're happy to answer any more questions. Um, you know, you can contact us by email or, or various sources. Um, I think to, uh, to stay on schedule here, we're, we're supposed to uh, hang up here. So thank you very much for listening and we appreciate the interest. Thank you. Bye-bye.